I remember when this album dropped, everybody either loved it or hated it. Personally, I thought it was just fine. You need to leave. This week marks the 10th anniversary, if you can believe it, of Deaf Heaven's Sunbather, and so I thought I'd give it another listen and see if it still holds up. I do always like this opening. Very pretty. Beach vibes. That was a good drop there. See, this kicks off so great, but I think the issue I have, and I'm curious if it'll happen again, is that it's it's beautiful for a while, and then it just keeps going. <laughs> that drumming. <laughs> There's no questioning that angle. These transitions are all really good, too. I gotta say, I've never really paid attention to the lyrics, and <laughs> this is, I don't know, a little pretentious. <laughs> There's a word you never thought you'd hear in black metal shrieks. I do like that bass, too. Another cool shift in, in pacing. And I'll give this song credit overall. Like, every time I think, like, oh, okay, the song should probably be winding down, they transition into something different and keep it interesting. <laughs> Definitely feeling something from this softer part too. After that that big deluge. It's kind of like the calm after the storm. Oh yeah. <laughs> I do think the lyrics here are very fitting to the overall feeling of the song in this moment too. Love this part too. These big guitar leads. Just this vibe of the acceptance. <laughs> so yeah, great opener. Dreamhouse is great. Like really great song the whole nine plus minutes of it every second of it is used effectively very strong great opener to the album it's honestly it's almost a 10 out of 10 track and then the seamless transition into irresistible another very pretty song i like the layered guitars a lot it's vibes it's vibes honestly i'm getting a little sad <laughs> but also concerned about wearing this mask for the next hour. A little piano coming in too. That, that gradual layering, very nice. Kind of clever way to pace out the record. You've got these longer opuses and then you're breaking it up with the semi-shorter interludes. Interesting how they really let the silence linger after that last part too. <laughs> A little attention to detail there, that's nice. Really, really solid. Definitely, definitely getting some feels with that one too. The title track, definitely the shoegaziest of the shoegazy. Is this Panopticon? <laughs> I'll have more to say on this, but I do think Panopticon is still the winner when it comes to this style and the originality that he brings to it. Good texturing with the riffs here too. It's kind of stream of consciousness, like very sort of vivid remembering something it definitely evokes some imagery even if it feels a little again pretentious at times good dynamics again again we're at like exactly three minutes when the average song might end and it's almost as if it's a formula where they know that <laughs> and so time to switch it up and there we go <laughs> again but with that also comes some issues where that formulaicness starts to wear on me already yeah see again love these riffs but I gotta say, it's just doing the last song again. <laughs> like so far, this is almost exactly the same formula as Dreamhouse. Come to think of it, it's the similar criticism I had of Lorna Shore. Again, the drumming though. Sounds like we even maybe have some brushes here. I could be wrong though. It might just be how he's rolling and how tight the snare is. Get a little darker on this part. To its credit. What a cool transition with the drumming here. Or the Cure sounding guitar there. A good build too, yeah. Yeah, another great song, well paced out. I think taken individually, each song is actually really good and they are great songwriters. But again, I think the issue is the kind of doing the same sort of thing over and over again doesn't necessarily work for me. Even within, like that's something, to be fair, that's a criticism I have of Black A's in general, is I just find that really boring. And it's those few bands, again, like Panopticon, like Mool, that stand out to me because 
every song kind of has its own personality, even though there's still this kind of undercurrent of the band's vibe, if you will. But with that, we're almost halfway through. I'm going to break for a drink. <laughs> Cheers. Next song. This is Please Remember. Again, I've never, <laughs> I've never read it. This is quite the wall of text. And I don't think I'm going to bother right now. The backtracking kind of reminds me of listening to like Kid A <laughs> from Radiohead. I like a little noise break. I like a little experimentation. I just don't know if I needed that much of that. Maybe cut that part in half. Speaking of Panopticon, <laughs> this is a very Panopticon riff. And I must point out, Kentucky came out the year before. Yeah, I want to be clear too, I'm not saying they ripped off Panopticon by any means, but I, I just, again, stands out to me. This song, it's fine. Um, I, again, I like the pacing, I like that it breaks things up, but I, did we need six and a half minutes of that? I don't really think so, personally. So, I think it should say I wouldn't cut it from the track listing, but I'd cut the like noisy backtracking static part by like a minute 30 max and then do maybe another minute 30 of the acoustic. I think the three minute interlude of Irresistible was good time. And so, yeah, I, I just think that that would work better. All right, Vertigo. Yeah, I do appreciate different kind of intro on this one. A little kind of spookier vibe. Notable also, this is the longest song on the album at 14 minutes and 37 seconds. I think also with how slow this song starts, it honestly like kind of defeats the need for that longer interlude. Like it's already got its own built in dynamics to switch us away from where we were at at the end of Sunbather. I do like that plotting bass. This does remind me of instrumental like indie bands I would listen to in Chicago. Also a little bit of like early Russian circles in there, which was around the same time. Shout out to an aesthetic anesthetic tiny little Chicago band I was friends with. You can still find their music on Bandcamp. All right, so we're at the three and a half minute mark. And there it is. <laughs> again, good pacing, but a little bit predictable. But again, very different type of song. I forgot about this riff. This part's pretty cool. A little solo action. And then the vocals coming in right on cue. I'm definitely feeling my third drink on this one. <laughs> I will say, looking down and seeing that we're only halfway through this one, it's, it's feeling a little bit more tedious. Hey, but right on cue again. Another transition. Take that floor, Tom. Kind of a little ray of hope shining through in the darkness, too. I have the Discord open, and right a few seconds after I said that it was feeling a little tedious, somebody said, like, I don't know why, but uh, Vertigo, Vertigo feels a little too long for me. Yeah, I'm not the only one. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of this part. It kind of drags here a little bit. Just the endless tremolo lines and blast beats. I'm forgetting the name of it, but there's a phenomenon where, like, if you hear the same sound long enough, your ears kind of adapt to it, and rather than kind of, like, have it keep droning on, it sort of, like, lowers the volume on that thing. And I, <laughs> it just reminds me of that. Yeah, and they throw in this new kind of riff here. But it's not that interesting. It's not the big change that some of those other songs had. Well, speak of the devil. <laughs> I wish the lyrics were synced up on this one, but they're not. I like those little drifty guitars. The reverb effect. But that's been done to death. Like, that goes back to the 80s at least. And especially in Black A's. Like, my god. Dime a dozen guitar part. Better transition here. But it still just doesn't feel like enough. Like, again, I'm feeling fatigued. And you could argue that's a, that's the purpose, but I'm just not connecting with it the same anymore emotionally. Yeah, it's like all that buildup for this. Yeah, I'm not in love with that one. It's like Dreamhouse is <clears throat> nearly a 10 out of 10. Sunbather's like a 9 out of 10. And then this one, it, it's like a 7 out of 10. Like, it, it drops quite a bit for me. There aren't even like those moments within the song that I love as much and again i think the fatigue kind of sets in from the repetition which is unfortunate because like they do change things up with this song there are elements of it that from a dynamics standpoint and pacing standpoint are good but it just doesn't end up being an interesting song in my opinion all right windows more backtracking and piano second shortest song on the album i like how this one's synced up but the actual song isn't <laughs> 
I gotta say, I think religious imagery is kind of played. It's not that it's not relevant anymore, it's just been so overdone. This is where if I'm in my car driving, I do... Boop! <laughs> Skip. Art student vibes. Yeah, I gotta say, like, maybe, maybe a minute of that, I would have been fine with it. Like, there are plenty of albums I listen to that have interludes kind of like that, but they're like 30 seconds, like a minute maximum. We didn't need all that. And it's just like, people are going to skip it. I, tell me in the comments and, and just comment in general where you agree and where you disagree with me. I love to hear different opinions on this stuff. Like, because unlike most people on the internet, I don't think that my opinion is the only opinion. And that's like interesting conversation is if we all agree but yeah if you if you don't skip this track i'm really interested to hear from you but i i want to hear almost like a poll how many of you actually listen to this song all the way through and how many of you skip it Let, let's be let's be honest all right final song the pecan tree wasting no time getting into this one i like that yeah again it's just not hitting as hard anymore because it's just like it's it's worn on me i think we need to Bring in a little bit more of that brightness, a little bit more alternation with that. Okay, a little, a little bit of that beachiness coming in here. There's an interesting little like echo on the drum here. And when paired with the bendiness of the guitar, it makes for this very kind of weird dreamlike effect. So it's a little psychedelic almost. Here's that brightness. Again, it's been a while. I still can't believe it's been 10 years. I gotta say too, between realizing that it's been 10 years since Sunbather came out and then realizing I've been a big fan of Blink-182 since 1999, I've been feeling very old this year. That's a good transition. More kind of the Cure vibes there. Cool little piano part here too. Very simplistic though. This late in the album, I would have dug something a little bit more complex. I do like this part. I feel like I'm just drifting away on a cloud. I do like that closing note. As a therapist in particular, I, I can relate to working with people like that. It, it would have almost been perfect if the song ended there, honestly. Yeah, that's my one major complaint. They didn't need to drag it out that last, like, honestly, you could cut that last two minutes or so, and it would be another, like, almost perfect song. So again... Dreamhouse like a 10, Sunbathers like a 9, and the Pecan Tree could be another 9, I would say. But as it stands, it, it kind of goes down to like maybe an 8. I like it better than Vertigo. And again, taken as a whole, it's like I think the stretch from song 1 to 3 is, is just like perfection. And if they had continued on that route... I could see why people would be raving about this album the way that they do. I'm going to take these headphones off too because they drive me crazy. But yeah, right around the middle of track four, it, it starts to lose me and it never fully gets me. I think they regroup quite a bit on this final track, but I agree with with my friend here on Discord that cut 10 minutes from this runtime and you could be working with like a perfect album. So does it hold up? I think so. Like there's aspects of it that I really love and there's aspects that I recognize why people love this album like they do. But at the same time, I think that it is kind of overrated. I do. I think that they've done some better and more interesting stuff since then. And then the reality too that I, I think I really want to talk about is I think that there are albums before this like Kentucky and others that I think do uh, some similar things, but do it more interesting. And I wish, I wish that Kentucky was as big as Sunbather, which I just don't think it is. I'd have to compare plays again. I'm actually curious. So here, each song averaging, you know, a million, two million, four million views, Dreamhouse at c coming up on nine million. Yeah, and then you got Poor Kentucky here, which I just think is a much more inventive and unique and special album and look at these run time. Look at look at these plays. Look at these views. Like that's so sad. None of them even close to a million. Like the opening track, we got half a million, and that's the best one. And to me, that's the sad part. That's kind of the injustice. Is I just think that there are better albums that even existed prior to this. And then yet Sunbather still gets held up. And I also think that there have been albums since this that are just 
much stronger. Again, I, I shouted out Mool, and I will again. I think that they're an incredible band that does a lot of this stuff, but does it better, more effectively, more concisely, with more brevity. And I got to say, too, I got to wonder, and I, I frequently do, if it didn't have this album cover, would it be the sensation that it was? Because I got to say, like, there was so much conversation. Oh, my God, there's a black metal album with a pink cover. And look, no, no shade there because it was a great marketing move. The aesthetic is great. Like, there's just something about this that is just so, like, I don't know, it captures your attention. And so I don't think it's bad that they did it. But on some level, I frequently find myself wondering what this album would have been if it didn't have this cover, if it had a more traditional cover or just uh, just a different cover. Would it have blown up the way that it did? And I think that's part of the overrated factor for me. But again, let me know down in the comments what you think. I think it's still stellar. Like, it, it's solid. It's really good. But taken as a whole, I think it's just fine. I think it really tapers off in the second half. And that kind of drags it down for me to the point that it's not something I go back and revisit a lot. Anyways, be sure to hit the like button if you've been enjoying the video and check out this playlist for plenty more videos, especially if you're new here. But that'll do it for now. Flight of Icarus signing off. I will see you in the trenches.